Hello, and welcome to this workshop on Yoga Nidra. Yoga Nidra is an ancient practice uh, that involves a progressive deep relaxation and then planting a affirmation and then a return to consciousness. Uh, it usually takes about 30, uh, anywhere from 15 to 45 minutes, depending on the type of Yoga Nidra that you're working with. The Probably the most important part of Yoga Nidra is the Sankalpa, the affirmation. And quite often uh, that is rushed. It's assumed that you already know what your Sankalpa is or that you can choose one quickly uh, in the time that you have during the practice itself. Uh, so I prefer to help students find their Yoga, um, their Sankalpa ahead of time. Uh, and then it's usually recommended that you use the same Sankalpa every time. Uh, for a period of time until you feel like it's beginning to have some effect. It's with repetition, uh, doing Yoga Nidra repeatedly and using the same Sankalpa that it becomes more powerful. So Yoga Nidra is sometimes called deep sleep or yogic sleep, but at the real heart of it, it's about reprogramming set patterns of consciousness. Okay? So first let's start with an overview and we'll start with the idea uh, in yoga of four states of consciousness. So they divide it into uh, the four following states. Wakefulness, and then the dreaming state. As you fall asleep, you move into dreaming. Then deep sleep, and in deep sleep the dreams cease. And then beneath that is what they sometimes call turiya, uh, T-U-R-I-Y-A. Uh, it is the underlying state of consciousness beneath everything that supports everything. Uh, so, in Western science, we have a similar idea, uh, except we define it in terms of brain waves. When the brain waves are really fast, we call it beta. Beta is associated with problem solving, thinking, worrying, anticipating, the mind's really racing. If the mind slows down a little bit into a still fast but a smooth, a little bit slower rhythm called alpha, we associate that with uh, focused creativity. So for instance, someone uh, painting a landscape, looking out at the landscape and painting it, painting what they see, someone writing uh, is an alpha state. Quite often if you think about a hobby that you really enjoy, that's an activity that helps you to find that alpha state. In alpha, you physically relax a little bit. Your breath becomes a little smoother, a little slower. But more importantly, you begin to feel a little more connected to life and to everyone. Uh, you begin to feel that the uh, reality is a nice place, uh, more contented. So it's a good place to be. Uh, alpha is uh, sometimes we find alpha when we drink alcohol. The alcohol slows down the brain waves. So if you think about after you've had one or two drinks and you stop worrying about things and you start enjoying uh, being around people, uh, that is the alpha state that you're enjoying. The trouble is the alcohol has a retarding effect to consciousness. So the trick is to get there without dulling the mind through alcohol. If the brain waves slow down even more, okay, we call that theta, and theta is the frequency we associate with dreaming. And then when the brain slows down even further into delta brain waves, the slowest rhythm, uh, we associate that with deep sleep. So if you compare that to the yogic model, it's very similar except we have beta and alpha are both waking states of consciousness. And in yoga, they lump them together into the one idea of waking consciousness rather than distinguishing between the two. And then yoga adds another layer beneath everything called the Turiya state, the state of witnessing without reacting. Okay. Uh, interesting story, Swami Rama back in the 70s came to America and the manager clinic was working with him. Uh, they heard that he could do all kinds of amazing things with his mind and with his body, and so they, under clinical conditions, decided to study him. And they asked him to meditate, and in his meditation, he was able to demonstrate uh, slowing the brain waves from beta to alpha, and then he slowed them down into a theta, 
uh, and then he slowed down into a delta state, and the researchers assumed that he had fallen asleep. Even though he had told them that yoga meditation is not the same as sleeping, the sleeping is different, uh, but he was still sitting up straight, but his brain was in a deep, slow delta rhythm. So one of the researchers had the idea to test to see whether or not he was actually asleep or meditating. And so over the intercom, they read out a list of grocery items and they monitored his brain waves and he didn't react. Uh, the indication was that he didn't hear the list because if he had heard it, he would have, there would have been activity in the mind. When you say cabbage, you might have a picture of a green uh, vegetable, round green vegetable, or you might have an image of coleslaw at a restaurant, but something stirs in the mind. And when they read the list out, nothing stirred, nothing moved, he didn't react. Uh, and so they pretty much assumed that he was asleep, even though he had said meditation is not sleeping. Uh, when they brought him back up and took off all the equipment and the tabs off his head monitoring brain waves, one of them asked, uh, by the way, did you hear anything? And Swami Ram was puzzled. He says, well, actually I did. It's a little strange, but someone was reading out a list of grocery items. And not only that, but he remembered all 20. Okay. Uh, this was a turning point in Western psychology because he was able to demonstrate that he to become conscious of his environment without reacting. Just this pure witnessing this turia beneath deep sleep. He didn't stay at deep sleep. He dropped down beneath that into this turia state where he was conscious uh, without reacting. Okay. So, probably helpful to understand about the uh, five koshas, uh, and these are sometimes referred to as the sheaths, if you think of a Russian nesting doll. Uh, the outermost sheath is the physical sheath. Sometimes it's called the food sheath, but it's this physical reality. Okay. Within that, a little bit smaller contained within that, is the prana. So we have the outside sheath is anamaya, the body. More subtle within that, we have the prana, prana maya. Okay. And prana is this life force in maya and then they'll say kosha. So anamaya kosha refers to the animal sheath, the body sheath. Pranamaya kosha refers to the energetic sheath, the energy moving through the body. Beneath that we have manamaya, and that is the senses and the mind. Okay? Now here we're talking, when we talk about the mind, what we're really talking about is the state of consciousness that a, a giraffe or a gerbil would have, okay? Uh, or we have it too. Okay? It's a state of the senses and then the mind resting on top of that. Now within that, a deeper level, we have Vishnamaya, Kosha, and this is, some people used to say it's uniquely human, now that's being questioned. Uh, there are a lot of animals that perhaps um, have uh, some capacity uh, to exist at this level, but it's a level of intellect and of discernment and of will. And then beneath all of that, at the very center, Anandamaya, uh, the bliss state. So those are the five sheaths coming in okay, or coming out. So. Let's take a look now at the sankalpa, about the affirmation, which is what we're going to be using during our yoga nidra practice. The affirmation is chosen, uh, not casually, not randomly, but it should be chosen through first recognizing what it is you struggle with and where you have reactions, where you react to life rather than choosing. So yoga has this wonderful idea uh, of a samskara. And the samskara is sometimes described as being like a, a rut or like a sandbar. So the idea here is that consciousness, if we use the metaphor of a river, 
uh, consciousness flows, the water flows through the river, and as it flows, if it flows a little bit too fast, it starts to set up these waves, and these waves begin to push down into the sand bed, and this creates a uh, ripple pattern in the sand. And then what's interesting is even after the river starts to flow smoothly again, slows down and flows steady and slow, the ripples in the sand remain. This is one way uh, geologists can tell whether a sandstone came from a riverbed or not or by moving water is by studying the shape and the pattern of those sandbars and of the ripples on the sandstone. So that's the idea, only they used it as a metaphor for the mind. And they say when the mind is moving fast and frenetically, uh, it generates these waves. These waves begin to create these samskaras, these patterns that are more stubborn. And even when the mind goes still, the pattern is still there. The sandbar is still there even when the water stops moving. Uh, anyone that has done a lot of meditation and been absolutely calm and happy and then gone home for Thanksgiving and had your parents push buttons and felt yourself reacting and realizing that you aren't illuminated, okay, that you weren't even close, uh, that's the difference. So we can still the mind, but those patterns, those sandbars are still there. And any time uh, that you get pushed, you can very easily start reacting from that pattern. So one of the problems with trying to make changes in ourself is that these patterns are held at a very deep level. Uh, and when we think about the, the levels of consciousness, uh, these patterns are down beneath the intellectual level. So in terms of the koshas, the sheaths, uh, we can't make the change at the outside level, the body. We can't make it at the pranic level. We can't even make it at the mana, mana level, the mind. Uh, we can't even make it at the intellectual level. How many people intellectually know that they should do something or not do something and still struggle? So what the yogis realized was that we have to get beneath the intellectual level. To begin to have an effect on the samskaras and to change these deeply, deeply held patterns. Uh, intellectual understanding isn't sufficient, we have to go beneath that, and so that is the practice of Yoga Nidra. We, through progressive relaxation and meditation, we see if we can get all the way down closer and closer to a Turiya state, and then in the Turiya state we plant our sankalpa, our affirmation. And the idea is that by planting it down beneath the intellect, that then the affirmation, like a little seed, begins to sprout and it grows up through all five levels, transforming us. Okay. Uh, so as you can see, the sankalpa is actually uh, very important. So then the question is, what is the right sankalpa? Uh, and this may take you, um, you may want to spend a few minutes, you may want to spend a few days uh, thinking about this and working on this, uh, but it's worth taking some time to delve into this more deeply. Okay. So how do we identify what is a good sankalpa, a good affirmation for us personally? And one of the ways that uh, I have worked with and I find very useful with myself and with the students is to start off by identifying what our triggers are. Where is it that you tend to lose uh, control and become reactive? Even if intellectually you know you shouldn't, you still find yourself reacting. Uh, and family can be a very good way of identifying those because we're closed in and they know you really well. Not only that, they know what your triggers are that go back to when you were three years old or five years old. Okay? And so they can get down to that pre-verbal level even and by knowing you that well, uh, and quite often they will expose those uh, triggers, those buttons, uh, those uh, sandbars, some scars. Uh, they know how to play those uh, without even knowing what they're doing or why they're doing it. Uh, quite often they can feed into that. So, if you think about something 
and some way you get triggered. Okay? We've got this complex little thing that happens. Uh, let's take one example. I'll just make up a story. Imagine that you're uh, five years old and that you're the youngest of three kids and you are walking by the kitchen and you happen to hear your parents talking and one of your parents, they're looking at their bills and they're budgeting and they're coming up short on money and they're frustrated and they're exhausted and one of your parents says in exasperation, I wish we'd stopped with two kids. Okay? Absolutely oblivious to the fact that you overheard that. Okay? And then you take that away with you and you begin to sit with that and the story you tell becomes important. So we have the first, the event, but then we have the story we make up about it. Okay? So imagine you make up the story, having heard your parents say, I wish we'd stopped with two kids. You make up the story that your parents don't love you. Okay? And then from that, it's very easy to make up a new story over time that you must be unlovable. If your parents don't love you, you must be unlovable. And then that story begins to take root. It could be a different story. It could be that you're lazy, or it could be that you don't have control. Uh, there's 10,000 different, different uh, ideas that can take root. But imagine that your idea that you've taken root in is that you are unlovable. Now, what happens as you go through life? Well, you've got that sandbar now, and when water starts flowing, it hits that sandbar and it causes the water to bounce. And then the bouncing water makes the sandbar bigger. The bigger sandbar makes the water bounce harder. And this builds up every time. Every time that sim scar gets hit, it grows. It gets hit again, it grows bigger. Imagine 20 years later, you're in college, uh, and, or out of college, and you see uh, your two best friends sitting in a restaurant having lunch, and you weren't invited. Well, if you already have that some scar uh, that you are unlovable, what story do you tell about what you just saw? It's very easy to tell the story to yourself that they don't like you and that they went out of their way to have some time in your absence. Okay? So again, this feedback loop starts existing. You see things and everything you see you filter through that samskar, making the samskar bigger and stronger, more tenacious, more powerful, and we get into a deep rut. Is there alternative stories that you could tell about what you saw in the restaurant? Yes. They could be some planning a surprise birthday party for you. Uh, there's 10,000 different stories that could explain what you just saw. So we tend to tell the story that supports the sankalpa. So how do we break out of this? Uh, well, quite often when you ask people intellectually, do you really believe that you're unlovable? They'll say no. And yet, the problem is still there beneath the surface. In certain circumstances, they still retreat back into that two-year-old feeling alone and unloved. Uh, and the intellect seems to be powerless to do anything about that. So, once you've identified what your core issue is, okay, and you may have more than one, most of us do, but you figure out what is the most important, what's the deepest, what is the one that's having the uh, most negative effects on your life. Once you've identified it, now you're ready to create your sun kalpa. Okay? So the sun kalpa has a few attributes. One of them is that the Sankalpa is uh, always positive, it's always stated in the present tense, and it's stated as if it's an accomplished fact, and it's stated with authority. Okay? And it's really interesting, uh, you know, a thousand years ago these practices are being developed, and now modern psychology has come to the same conclusion. The brain doesn't distinguish between past and future in certain ways, and by stating in the present moment, it's more powerful effect on the brain. So modern psychology is rediscovering these ideas from yoga. So it is positive, it's in the present tense, and it's stated with power and authority. And then in the Yoga Nidra, we like to then link it back to the Turiya state, bliss, nirvana. Okay. So, give you an example with the 
uh, example we're using, uh, I feel unlovable, okay, or I am unlovable, then I create my sankalpa to try and erase that samskar, that sandbar, to try and smooth it out a little bit. So my sankalpa uh, could be along the following lines. I am lovable. Okay. Then I link it to the Turiya state by saying, I am lovable because I am pure love. Okay. If my problem was feeling um, lazy and tired and depressed, I might say, for my, some, uh, for my Sankalpa, I might say, I am full of energy, life, and vigor because I am pure love. If my problem is anger, I might say, I am calm, relaxed, and forgiving because I am pure love. Okay. And that's it. That's your sankalpa. So then the practice of Yoga Nidra. We go through a series of exercises starting off with just physically getting comfortable uh, laying down. You want to make sure that you are really, really comfortable because you're going to be there for longer than a typical Shavasana. Uh, so you take the time to put a pillow under your knees if you need it, support under your neck, um, an eye pillow if you want it. Um, certainly you need to be comfortable in temperature, so maybe putting a blanket over you. Your body temperature will drop a little bit as you relax, and so if you are just barely warm enough, you won't be able to relax completely. So blanket over you can be very helpful. Uh, we go through a series starting with kind of a miniature Shavasana exercise and then we go through um, some other uh, different stages including visualization uh, and then at some point you will be asked to plant or to repeat your Sankalpa and we do that at two different places during the exercise. We do it at the close to the very beginning and then when we get to the deepest place of relaxation, when we get as close as we can get to the Turiya state, beneath even the uh, deep sleep, then you'll be asked to repeat your Sankalpa three more times. And then the final part is the return and you'll be slowly brought back up to a higher level of consciousness. Uh, it is very, very helpful if during the entire exercise you remain still. However, uh, if you get uncomfortable, uh, pretending you aren't isn't going to work. So if you get uncomfortable, uh, go ahead and do what you need to. Uh, if you need to roll over uh, or reposition, go ahead and do it. But uh, better is start off in a position so that that won't happen. I'd like to thank you for joining me for this mini workshop and if you'll stay tuned uh, we'll try our hand at doing a yoga nidra uh, experiential session next namaste